Bias is a process at any stage of inference, tending to produce results that depart systematically from true values. It's an error in the conception and design of a study, or in the collection, analysis, interpretation, publication or review of data, leading to results or conclusions that are systematically, as opposed to randomly, different from the truth. Bias usually produces deviations or distortions that tend to go in one direction. It becomes a problem when it weakens a true association, or produces a spurious association, or distorts the apparent direction of association between variables. For example, patients with inguinal hernia who get laparoscopic repair seem to have less post-operative pain and more rapid return to work than those who get the traditional open surgery. A careful clinician asks, are the results of laparoscopic surgery really better or might they only appear better as a result of biases in the way the information was collected? Perhaps laparoscopic repair is offered to patients who are in better health or seem to have better tissue strength because of age or general fitness. Perhaps surgeons and patients are more inclined to think that the procedure should cause less pain because it's new and the scar is smaller and so the patients report less pain and the surgeons are less likely to ask about it or are less likely to record pain in the medical record. Perhaps patients who get laparoscopic surgery are usually instructed to return to work earlier than those who get open surgery. If any of these were so, the favourable results could be related to systematic differences in how patients were selected for the laparoscopic procedure, how they reported their symptoms, or how they were told what they could do, rather than a true difference in success rate. If any of these were so, the favourable results could be related to systematic differences in how patients were selected for the laparoscopic procedure, how they reported their symptoms, or how they were told what they could do, rather than a true difference in success rates. Observations in patients, whether for patient care or research, are particularly susceptible to bias. The process tends to be just plain untidy. As participants in a study, humans have the disconcerting habit of doing as they please, and not necessarily what would be required for producing scientifically rigorous answers. When researchers attempt to conduct an experiment with them, as one might in a laboratory, things tend to go wrong. Some people refuse to participate, whereas others drop out or choose another treatment. In addition, clinicians are inclined to believe that their therapies are successful. This attitude, which is so important in the practice of medicine, makes clinical observations particularly vulnerable to bias. Although dozens of biases have been defined, most fall into one of four broad categories, namely selection, allocation, measurement or recall bias. Selection and allocation bias belong to the category of assembly bias, which arises when groups being compared are not equally susceptible to the outcome of interest for reasons other than the factor under study. Allocation bias occurs if investigators choose a non-random method of assigning subjects to study groups or if the random method that has been chosen isn't followed. For example, allocation bias would have occurred if patients chosen to receive the laparoscopic procedure were healthier than those who were chosen to have open surgery. The researchers might have done this because they favoured the intervention and wished to show that it was more effective than the control treatment. Selection bias is considered to have occurred when subjects are allowed to select the study group they want to be in. For example, more educated or more desperate or more influential people may lobby hard to be enrolled in the intervention group for a novel therapy. Detection bias is the result of failure to detect a case of disease, a possible causal factor or an outcome of interest. It can be caused by the use of a particular diagnostic technique or type of equipment. For example, cancer rates may vary in different geographical regions, not because of an actual difference in the incidence of the disease, but because of different diagnostic technologies. 
Measurement bias occurs when the method of measurement leads to systematically incorrect results. For example, blood pressure levels are powerful predictors of cardiovascular disease. However, multiple studies have shown that taking a blood pressure measurement is not as simple as it seems. Correct measurement requires using appropriate procedures, including using a larger cuff size for overweight and obese adults, positioning the patient so that the upper arm is below the level of the right atrium and so the patient does not have to hold up their arm, and taking the measurement in a quiet setting and multiple times. If any of these procedures is not done correctly, the resulting measurements are likely to be artificially and systematically elevated. Another factor leading to systematically higher blood pressure readings is sometimes called white coat hypertension. It often occurs when blood pressure is being measured by physicians, suggesting that visits to the doctor cause anxiety in patients. Also, clinicians who deflate the blood pressure cuff faster than 2 to 3 millimeters per second will likely underestimate systolic but overestimate diastolic blood pressure. Studies have also shown a tendency for clinicians to record values that are the normal level in patients with borderline high blood pressures. Systematic errors in blood pressure measurements can, therefore, lead to overtreatment or undertreatment of patients in clinical practice. Clinical research based on blood pressure measurements taken during routine patient care can lead to misleading results unless careful standardized procedures are used. These kinds of biases led to the development of blood pressure measurement instruments that do not involve human ears and hands. Confounding can occur when we're trying to find out whether a factor such as behavior or drug exposure is a cause of disease in and of itself. If the factor of interest is associated with another second factor, which itself is also related to the outcome, the effect of the factor under study, the first factor, that can be confused with or distorted by the effect of the second factor. So in essence, confounding is the confusion of two supposedly causal variables, so that part or all of the purported effect of one variable is due to the other. The effect is to potentially obscure a true causal relationship. For example, supplements of antioxidants such as vitamins A, C and E are popular with the lay public. Laboratory experiments and studies of people who choose to take antioxidants initially suggested that antioxidants prevent cardiovascular disease and certain cancers. However, careful randomized studies which are able to avoid confounding, routinely found little effect of antioxidants. In fact, when results of these studies were combined, use of antioxidants, especially at high doses, was associated with small increases, not decreases, in death rates. How could the results of early studies be reconciled with the opposite findings of later, carefully controlled trials? Confounding has been suggested. People who take antioxidants on their own are likely to do other things differently than those who do not take antioxidants, such as exercise more, watch their weight, eat more vegetables, and not smoke. And it may be these activities, not the antioxidants, that led to lower death rates in the studies not randomizing the intervention. Most clinical research studies, especially studies that observe people over time, routinely try to avoid confounding variables in the analysis. Variables such as age, sex and race are almost always analysed for confounding because so many health outcomes vary according to them. Studies that involve human behaviour, such as taking antioxidants regularly, are especially prone to confounding because human behaviour is so complex that it's difficult to analyse for all the factors that might influence it. It's worth noting that a study may involve several types of biases and confounders at the same time. For example, concerns have been raised that caffeine consumption during pregnancy may lead to adverse fetal outcomes. 
it would be unethical to determine if caffeine is dangerous to fetuses by an experiment assigning some pregnant women to drink high levels of caffeine and others not. So researchers have usually studied what happens during pregnancy according to the amount of caffeine ingested. However, several biases have been demonstrated in many of these studies. Measurement bias could have occurred because most studies relied on self-reported intake of caffeine. One study demonstrated recall bias, a type of measurement bias that refers to differential recall in people with an adverse outcome compared to those with a normal outcome. An association was found between caffeine consumption and miscarriage when women were interviewed after they miscarried, but not when women were questioned about caffeine consumption before miscarriage. If some women were recruited for caffeine studies during prenatal visits, women who are likely to be particularly health conscious, and others recruited towards the end of their pregnancy, the different approaches to recruitment could lead to selection bias that might invalidate the results. Finally, heavy coffee consumption is known to be associated with cigarette smoking, lower socioeconomic levels, greater alcohol consumption, and generally less health consciousness, all of which could confound any association between caffeine and adverse fetal outcomes. The potential for bias does not mean that bias is actually present in a particular study, or, if present, would have a big enough effect on the results to matter. For a researcher or reader to deal effectively with bias, it's first necessary to know where and how to look for it, and what can be done about it. But one should not stop there. It's necessary to determine whether bias is actually present, and how large it is likely to be, and then decide whether it's important enough to change the conclusions of the study in a clinically meaningful way. Bias and confounding present problems at different points in a clinical study. When selection bias, for example, exists in a study, irreparable damage results and eternal validity is doomed. By contrast, when confounding is present, this can be corrected, provided that confounding was anticipated and the requisite information gathered. Confounding can be controlled for before or after a study is done. But how do we deal with biased samples? Biased samples are unrepresentative, therefore, True randomization is the best proof against bias. How do we control for confounding? Well, there are four possibilities. The simplest approach is restriction, which is also called exclusion or specification. For example, if cigarette smoking is suspected to be a confounding factor, a study can enroll only non-smokers. Although this tactic avoids confounding, it also hinders recruitment and thus power and precludes extrapolation to smokers. Restriction might increase the internal validity of a study at the cost of poorer external validity. A second option to control for confounding is called pairwise matching. In a case control study in which smoking is deemed a confounding factor, cases and controls can be matched by smoking status. For each case who smokes, a control who smokes is also found. This approach, although often used by investigators, has two drawbacks. If matching is done on several potential confounding factors, the recruitment process can be cumbersome, and, by definition, one cannot examine the effect of a matched variable. A third option is called stratification. This is where investigators can control for confounding after a study has been completed. Stratification allows the association between exposure and outcome to be examined within different strata or levels of the confounding variable, for example age, sex, alcohol consumption. If we were conducting a study to examine the association between lung cancer and urban atmospheric pollution, controlling for smoking, the population could be stratified according to smoking status. The association between air pollution and cancer can then be assessed separately within each stratum. When the purpose of a study is to compare health status in different populations, i.e. exposed versus non-exposed, standardization of summary rates is carried out in order to take into account differences in characteristics between the two populations, such as age or gender. So for example, coronary heart disease rates 
increase with age. Let's say 12% of population A are over the age of 65, whereas in population B, only 6% are over the age of 65. Therefore, higher crude death rates would be expected in population A on the basis of age difference alone. Standardisation allows for adjustment needed to negate the effects of a variety of confounding factors, including age, sex, race or socio-economic status. So to sum up, dealing with confounding is reasonable if you know what the likely confounders are. However, dealing with unknown confounders is obviously much trickier. There's always a risk that an apparent association between a risk factor or an intervention and an outcome is being mediated by an unknown confounder. Is being mediated by an unknown confounder. This is particularly true of observational studies where patients may be selected to one treatment group or another, not according to any explicit criteria, but by some unknown process, such as a care provider's gut feeling. The best defence against unknown confounders is also randomisation. This ensures that both known and unknown confounders are randomly distributed between treatment groups.